Everybody all right this morning? Y'all look a little sleepy this morning. Is it just my hearing's going bad? Is it like we were kind of dragging this morning? We ought to be excited this morning. God woke us up, didn't he? We're still among the living. So God is good. I need to get all of the formalities out of the way before I speak the word of God this morning. It is just a blessing to be here this morning in the house of the Lord. There's no other place I would rather be than is the house of the Lord. I want to thank Brother Martin and my brethren here at the Hardy Street Church of Christ for the opportunity to stand before you and share what thus says the Lord. For those who don't know me, Brother Jeffers is my name, and I usually introduce my wife at this time. Uh, but those who know that she passed away on uh, May the 5th, uh, that was my better half for 41 years. Uh, but God is still good in the midst of everything. It's going to take a, a lot of prayer and supplication for me to continue my race, but my race is not done yet. Uh, we shared a long, prosperous life, and I'm going to miss her dearly. Uh, but I thank God that he answered our prayers, and she battled that pancreatic cancer for two years. And we got to the point where she was suffering. My prayer was, God, don't let her suffer another day. So he told her to come on home. You have completed your assignment. Now rest your head in peace. So I was told I'll see her on the other side. I still got work to do, and I'm not tired yet. I still got a little running in me. So uh, there's work to be done, and we know as Christians, our job is a 24-7, 365 day job. We don't get to rest. The world is in shambles. The world has lost its mind. It's a lot of work to do, and we must do our job. God doesn't need part-time Christians. We need full-time Christians. We can't retire from the Lord. The only time we can retire from the Lord is when we retire from our labor here on this side of time's life. So, again, it is just a pleasure to be here this morning. It's therapeutic for me because I know the grieving process. I know what I'm in store for. So uh, anytime that I can speak the word of God, it, it helps my mind stay focused on the task, which is to seek and save the lost. You know, I told people a long time ago, don't feel sorry for me. When I go through my trials and my tribulations, don't feel sorry for me because my wife died. Just show me empathy. Because when you show me empathy, you understand what I'm going through. You can reach a hand out to help me when I can need to be picked up. You can pray for me when I need prayer. And you will be there to listen when I need you to listen. So I just need empathy this morning. So bear with me this morning. If I get a little emotional, uh, it's not because I'm sad. It's just because I'm happy in the Lord. Uh, so I'm just going to continue to do what God will have me to do. So this morning, I hope you can trust and pray that you have come with an open and receptive mind to hear the word of God. We know they have the, the race that's going on today, and some of you didn't get here early enough. That's because you didn't leave the house early enough. We always got to prepare when things are going on because the Lord's work is important. You have to prepare yourself to do the Lord's work. You can't make excuses and say, well, I didn't know the 500 race was coming because it, it happens every year at the same time and on the same day. So you have to prepare to be here. Because whatever is important to you, you prepare to get there. Because I know many of you won't miss work on Tuesday because tomorrow is a holiday. Amen. Amen. But God's grace and mercy, and we're thankful for that. I want to thank the brothers for leading us in our devotional part of our service this morning. And I want to jump into this lesson. I think in Sunday school, we had a good Sunday school this morning. It was all in my lesson this morning. That's how God works. God knows what you need when you need it. And so we had reading in our hearing Romans, the fourth chapter, and verses were 24 and 25, and we dropped down to the fifth chapter where we looked at verses 1 through 6. And I'm just going to reread this for emphasis sake as we get into our lesson this morning. And the Bible says in Romans, the fourth chapter, and the verses are... 24 and 25. The Bible says, 
but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised us up, Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The fifth chapter, starting at verse one, the Bible says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work at patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope make us not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When we, we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I believe this morning this message will show that for the very reason Christ came into the world, and for us, he gave his life. When I think of a particular season, when I use that word season, which means time, because we're in a perilous times today. I cannot help but be amazed at the depth of God's love for all people. I cannot help but stand in awe that the real fact that God would love an imperfect people. If you didn't know that you were imperfect, just keep living. Yet we're imperfect, yet we're sinful, and, and we're undeserving people so much, instead of leaving us, God had his son die because we were yet sinners. And because of our sin, he would go to such great lengths for us not to die. But yet God rescued us because mankind needed rescuing. And thank God for having the insight what man needed before man knew what he needed. And I believe this morning many of us are amazed that what God has done for us, that he will send his only one son to save us. I don't know about you. I just like to keep it real. If, if I was in God's position, and thank God I'm not. I wouldn't send my only son for nobody else's sin. But I'm not God. And thank God I'm not God. But I believe the sacrifice that God sent, there was only one man that could fulfill the sacrifice. And that was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if dying in our place is not enough, God raised his son from the dead, breaking the power of control of sin and death, that he might forevermore give us a new life, all that we would believe and turn to him. But you have to do something on your part. When you hear the word of God, it must convict you in your heart to turn from your ways and turn to God's way. Yet one of the greatest reflections as I study the word of God is it always seems that there's a season for great rejoicing. In a time of perilous times, there's still times to rejoice. No matter how dark the days get, no matter what you're going through, there's always a time to rejoice when you're in Christ Jesus. That's because we have hope. And those who do not have hope cannot rejoice in their problems and their issues. It's not a day that we wake up and we don't have problems and issues. When you go to bed, your issues and problems will be waiting on you when you get up in the morning. You can sleep them away. You can drink them away. You do whatever you want to do, but your problems are not going nowhere until you address them. But thank God for grace and mercy. As I look at this text, it becomes more evident that Jesus did not come to the earth to resolve a problem for himself. He did it not to endure the mockery and the contempt, the hatred and the rejection and the persecution because he had, he had to or he deserved it. 
It's interesting to me as I read the Bible and I read it over and over and over and I see how unjust that Jesus was treated. Not because what he'd done, it was because it was necessary. He did it not to taste the pain of agony and death. On that old rugged cross. Not because he had sinned, not because he was a sinner, but because he loved sinners. And he committed himself to the cause that he was called for. I don't know about you this morning, but when I think about the resurrection, because he has something to prove to himself, Jesus had nothing to prove. He is the son of the living God. He had did no wrong and there was no sin in him. Brother, it becomes probably clear that he did it all because of you and me. Well, this world was a dying people. We were the reason he came. We were the reason such love and mercy had been shown to us. Yes, Jesus, the son of God, came not on his own good of purposes, but he came to the purpose of showing God to man and saving man to God. So this morning, if I could talk on the subject, we were the reason. We were the reason. And as I look at Romans, the fourth chapter in verses 24 and 25. The first truth I want us to, to see and look at is that we were the reason why Jesus came to bring salvation. That word salvation means to be rescued or saved of harm, ruined or lost. And as Paul wrote in the fourth chapter, verse 25, he says that he was delivered unto death for our sin. Not his own, but our sins. If you kept a tab on your sin, just yours alone, I don't know how many books you would need, how many pieces of paper you would use, how many closet full of your sins would overfill what you have done. But thank God for grace and mercy. You know, I learned a long time ago when I became a Christian, I would never be sinless, but I need to sin less. I need to understand why Christ died for me and changed my ways. I know I'm not perfect, but I serve a perfect God. There's nothing I cannot do in Christ Jesus. I can't make excuses why I'm doing what I keep doing when I know it's wrong. I can't justify sin because sin in God's eyes is sin. We know that old phrase, oh, it was just a little lie, or it was a white lie, whatever color you want to paint it. Sin is sin in God's eyes. And right is right and wrong is wrong. And God will hold us accountable. But I believe when Jesus was sent into this world to be the Savior, to be one who rescued man's kind from the consequences, Everything you do has consequences. Everything. Right, wrong, or indifference. You can say why you did it and why you meant to do it and, and try to justify, but everything has consequences. And if the world would understand that today, we would have a better world today. But yet the power and destruction of sin in order to bring us unto freedom and life, the scriptures tell us that Jesus was given over and handed over to crucify and put to death, not because of a crime he committed or a sin he is of his own. But his righteousness life was given in exchange for the unrighteous lives of men. Are you willing to give your life over to somebody that's done wrong and you've done right? Most of us are not. But we must think and, and act like the and, and understand the mind of God. That's why it's imperative that we study the word of God. Not only study, read it, but live it. We as the church are at a crossroads in the church today. We've gotten to a point where we don't want to even fellowship with our sister congregations all over the brotherhood. We don't want to tell our sisters and brothers when they're in wrong or they're in error because we say, that's not my problem and that's not my issue. But 
But the Bible says that I am my brother's keeper. It's not that I want to get in your business, but you are my business. If you're my brother and my sister and I come to you in love. And tell you that you are wrong. Don't take it out on me. I'm just following the structure that the, book, the word of God says. In the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter, the Bible says, when a brother or sister is taken over and fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and considering thyself. I'm not judging you. I just care about you. But we need more of that in the brotherhood today. My problem is every brother and sister all across the brotherhood. If you got a problem, I got a problem. If you're struggling, I'm struggling. And whatever I can do to attend to you and help you, I ought to be able to do that with love in my heart. Don't condemn me if I care about you because the world doesn't care nothing about you. If you don't believe me, don't come to work tomorrow on Tuesday. Don't show up and do your job. Let, let corporate America feel that they need more money. They'll downsize real quick. No matter how many years you've been there, I don't need your service anymore. But there's one place you can always find that you'll never have a layoff. It's in the church. Because there's always work to do. And God will keep you employed if you want to work. Don't fall into that that, that, old, that old saying that there's nothing to do in the church. That's a lie. There's always something to do in the church if you want to do it. But we are the reason that Jesus came. I believe the fact that Jesus was completely right and innocent, he confirmed by the one th thing that happened when he was up on the cross. There were two men that he was put in between, two thieves on the cross when they crucified him. In Luke, the 23rd chapter, when Jesus was nailed on the cross, one criminal in the text yelled insults and, and mocked him. The one criminal on the other side said and rebuked the other one, said the mocker by saying, don't you fear God since you're serving the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, the thief said. But this man has done nothing wrong. How many times have you seen people that can tell the truth when they're being persecuted? Most people want to make it about the other person when they've done something wrong. But yet one man had an understanding that this man had done nothing wrong. Can we do that? Can we understand the principle and the teaching in Scripture? When someone has not done wrong, we can stand up both faces and say they have not done nothing wrong if it's not going to benefit me. But I believe the Scriptures tell us in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in verse 15, that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. If Jesus can do it, why can't we? If we're children of God, if we are given the Holy Spirit upon baptism and we walk in the newness of life, why can we not mimic the Savior? We're not powerless. Don't you know as a child of God, you have more power than the president of the United States? You have power from on high. When God gave you the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that raised Christ up from the dead, you have power. You should never walk around with your head hanging down. Don't worry about where you live and what kind of education you have. If you got an education in the COC, you got the greatest education ever ever been. We ought to continue to act like we're somebody. Because we serve somebody that's greater than anyone. We must continue the fight. We must continue our work as Christians. Do not become complacent in the work of the Lord. The world is in trouble, if you have not noticed. Every time you turn on the television, you see somebody has gotten killed. It gets closer to home every day. 
Every day it's getting closer to your house. See, right now this might not be at your doorstep, but one day it's going to knock on your door and it's going to wake you up. Then what? If you haven't prepared yourself, if you haven't had a relationship with God, if you're not doing the work of the Lord, if you're not doing what God has told you to do, you're in trouble. We're not exempt as Christians. Jesus said, if I suffer, you're going to suffer. If they would kill the son of God and he had done no wrong, we know what they will do to us. Yeah, I know a lot of times we get caught up on this color thing. Guy asked me the other day, he said, yeah, man, black people been oppressed for that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. I said, mankind has been oppressed for thousands of years. Yeah, I understand history, but let me, your enemy is not man. Your enemy is Satan. When you don't know who your enemy is, you're looking in the wrong place and you're fighting the wrong battle. We must understand God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Your fight is a spiritual fight. It is not flesh and blood. It is not the Republicans. It's not the Democrats. It is that old slick person that was back in the garden a long time ago. And his name is Satan. And Satan is very good at what he does. He had you fighting amongst yourself. He had you killing your, your brother. He had you killing your mother, your father. If you have not noticed, people will kill anybody today just to get what they want. And yet they'll say, I'll ride or die with you. you my friend. I don't have friends. I got one friend, and that's Jesus. I have people I associate with, but I got one friend. That's Jesus Christ. I know, you, Brother Jeff, I thought you said your wife is your best friend. I didn't say she was my best friend. You took that wrong. You took that literally. I use it in a figurative sense. I love her like a friend. She's more than a friend. And when we talk about friends, we have to understand when you put that label on somebody, that friend label, they ought to have the characteristics of Jesus Christ. If they're not acting like Christ, why would I want you to be my friend? But I believe when we start to understand the mind of God and what God expects of us, we go a little bit further than a friend. On the physical side, you learn to love people. You don't have to like them, but you got to love them. Sometimes I don't like myself. I know we used to have a conversation, me and my wife, I would come home sometime, and you know, I say, you know what, I'm tired today. I don't like you, but I love you. And love kept me there for 41 years. Because if I just liked you, I would have packed my bags and I would have left a long time ago. But when you learn to love somebody, you learn to put up with people like God puts up with us. God first loved us. When we start to understand the mind of God, we love and mimic God, we will be a better people. We will be a better church. Everybody's got issues and everybody's got problems. You might just be able to hide yours a little bit better than me. But you got them. But we have to understand we must recognize our issues and our problems. And guess what? Work on them. If God woke you up today, you got time to work on yourself. And we must learn as the church, stop trying to work on everybody else. I can say that because I'm leaving after the day. Learn to work on self first. And when you work on self, then you can help somebody. You have to learn to help yourself first. Because nobody will stand in your, your judgment seat when the time comes. You have to stand before yourself. But I believe when Jesus' rejection and crucifixion, and the death had been foretold hundreds of years earlier. And that's what's so good about the Bible today. When we read the word of God. There is no surprises in the word of God. 
if you're reading the word of God and you study the word of God, you already know the rest of the story. God is not going to surprise you. He already foretold you in his word. This is what's going to happen. The time is going to come. This is what you need to do. If you want to go where I'm going to be, this is what you got to do. We cannot be ignorant of the word of God. There was a time God winked at man's ignorance, but now he calls all men unto repentance. Because you never be able to say, God, I didn't know. You can't use that excuse anymore. Jesus died once that we all might have a right to the tree of life. He's not going to die again. He's not going to come back and reauthenticate his power and his position. There's not going to be no rapture. There's not going to be a thousand years. And we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. See, when you understand the word of God and you rightly divide the word of God and you talk about that thousand year reign, that is a figurative. That's not literal. And when you understand the word of God, John was using symbols and a symbol cannot symbolize itself. The Bible is so simple, we miss it. What do you mean, Brother Jefferson? So when you hear a, a car backfire, what do you always say? Sounds like a gunshot, but it was not. So it symbolized. A symbol cannot symbolize itself. John was just using things that man might understand those things to get a better understanding. He talked about heaven in the book of Revelations. Talked about the streets paved as gold. He didn't say they were gold. He said paved as of gold. You can't make a physical in a spiritual. But you have to rightly buy the word of truth. And you get an understanding of the Bible simple. You don't need a PhD to understand the word of God. Jesus said it plainly. If you come to me with the mindset of a child, we got to stop overanalyzing and trying to Outsmart God. Now, think God. You're not that good. God's word is simple and it's plain. But I believe when we look at Jesus from the standpoint of his crucifixion, when the prophets had prophesied about the righteous servant would come and die for the sins of mankind. You have your Bibles. Turn over to. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, because I believe when we look at the word of God, we get a better understanding if we would read it, understand it and apply it. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, given a description, a description of who the Savior was and who was coming. He said, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He had no form of comeliness. See, this is what gets me about people when they try to depict who Jesus was and who he is. For many years when we were coming up, I don't know about you, but when I was little, they always had this picture of Jesus in the house. He had blue eyes. He was white and he had long hair. And I looked at her and said, who is that, mama? She said, that's Jesus. I said, well, when I read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, that doesn't describe blue eyes and his low hair, and he looks so handsome. Jesus was a rough-looking man. That doesn't look like a rough-looking man. But see, when man starts to depict who Jesus was, they don't get it right. If you want to get it right, go to the word of God. There's no surprises. But here's the flip side of this, that we as a as a nation, we as a people of culture, people of color, we always say, well, Jesus was black. See, I know he was. It don't make Jesus could have been green. That doesn't give you a better position with God. God is no respect a person. He don't care about your color. He created you. He cares about your heart. So whatever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You can be a black devil. You can be a white devil. You can be green, mixed, whatever you got. God sees through it all. So let's look at God from what the word of God. There is no surprises in the Bible. 
It says that when we should see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. See, the children of Israel wanted a, a king, a savior. They wanted him to look good and all this thing. But that's not what God's plan was. See, we get caught up on visual, what we can see. How many of you, when you was in a relationship coming up, that you always passed that guy up that was ugly? I just talked to the sisters this morning. Oh, no, he's too ugly. Ain't nothing good about it. He don't look good. But then you'll say, you see him 10, 15 years later, now he makes about six figures. He's got a nice car and he got a nice home. And now you start to say, well, he looks pretty good now. <laughs> see, you know, when I was young, you know, most brothers, we was young, we always wanted the pretty woman, didn't we? Light, light skin, brown skin, whatever skin, what color she got. She just had to be pretty. See, and we always wanted to be the player. We wanted to say, yeah, she looked good. I got the best looking girl at school and all this. But then when you got in a relationship with her, you found out she was ugly. Because her attitude didn't match the face. See, I learned a long time ago, I started with the ugly women. Then I made my way up to the pretty women. Because the ugly women taught me some things. They told me how to treat a woman. How to respect a woman. So then when I got to that woman that was a little bit prettier, guess what happened that, with that relationship? See, she then had to meet my standards, not I meet her standards. But see, when we understand things from the word of God, we understand things a little bit clearer. As I have always said, an ugly person will be with you there to eternity. A good-looking person will leave you on the drop of a dime. That's just real talk. Never have a relationship with some just because they have a good-looking face. It depends on what's appealing. We can work on the rest, but this right here has got to be intact. The heart. Because whatever is in this heart is how we're going to get along. Because you know what? One day, that pretty face is going to get some wrinkles in it. It's not going to look like it used to look. One morning, you're going to wake up, you're going to look like and say, who's that over there? That's not the one I married 30 years, 40 years ago. But if you love them for who they are, the commitment that you make, guess what? Honey, you look just as good as you did 20, 25 years ago. Because it was what here that keeps me with you. It'll help you in your Christianity. It'll help you in your walk, in your faith. No man has seen God. But we got to keep serving by faith. We see what God does for us each and every day. God is always on time. God is faithful. The seasons change every year. The sun comes up. The moon's out there. God is faithful and God is consistent. So if he is consistent, we need to be consistent. That means we need to worship God every day of our life. Even when we're having problems and issues in our life, even when we have death strikes our home, you still serve God. It is not a reason to stop serving God because you got problems and issues in your life. Newsflash, you're going to always have problems and issues in your life. They're not going anywhere. It's how you deal with them. And the Bible gives you instructions how to deal with everything in your life. You just got to be ready to put it into application. Let me tell you what, it's not going to always be pleasant. It's not pleasant dealing with God's people. I know I've been dealing with y'all for a long time. And some of the hardest people to get along with is the people in the church. You know why? Because they just like me. I think I'm the best thing since peanut butter and jelly. I got my own way of thinking, my own way of doing things. And if you don't measure to what I think and how I feel, you know what? I got a problem with you. 
But how can we have a problem with one another when Jesus left heaven, put on flesh, came down to walk this earth, died for your sins and my sins? So how can I really have an issue with you? If we have the right mindset. I love you in spite of all your issues. No matter what you say to me, what you do to me, I love you. I may not like you, but I love you. Because I will never allow no one to rob me of my joy and no one to trip me up to make it to heaven. So if I have to put up with you, it may sometimes I might have to do it from a distance. How you doing? See you later. Still love you, though, praying for you. Doesn't mean I have to sit down and eat with you every day of the week. But I love you and I'm praying for you. I respect you. That goes a long way. And that's what God expects of us. That's why Jesus had to come. Jesus was the reason it was because of you and me. He knew we had issues. He knew we were going to have problems. But I'm so glad he had the four mind and understanding to have things in place. That when we have issues and problems, we can go to the word of God. And it will help you. It will direct you. It will guide you. It will guide you to all truth. But you've got to read it and study it and live it. Because the days are getting worse. It's harder to put up with people today. It's not like it was 30, 40 years ago. Somebody will shoot you just by if you look at them wrong today. You stepped on my, you, you, you cut in front of me. I'm going to chase you down. I'm going to shoot and kill you just because you cut me off. Or you looked at me funny. Anytime you have a 12-year-old kid will take a gun to school and shoot a teacher, something's wrong. But this is the kind of place the world is in. But it's no surprise. God said it would. We must be prepared and prepare ourselves. We must prepare our children. We must keep implementing the things God said, how to raise a child. Stop raising your child in sports and get them in the church. They're not going to be the next Michael Jordan. Don't waste your time. If you want to invest in your child, Teach them the word of God. Bring them to church. Don't send them. You bring them to church. But you raise your child in the Lord. They're going to they're gonna go away sometime. We all lose our way. But raise a child. And when they get older, they won't forget it. They know that there's something they can fall back on. And let me tell you, the word of God is true. It's powerful. Once you get a taste of the word of God, you'll never forget it. You're going to need it. I remember, I used to go to church every day of the week. I used to hate going to church. My father was a preacher. We was at church every day. They called us the churches. We was in church that much. And as I got older, when I got older to make my own decision, I went away from the church. I didn't want to have nothing to do with them folks up in the church. I told them they were the biggest hypocrites I ever seen in my life. But I didn't have an understanding. But yet, when tragedy struck my life as a young man, I found my way back home. And I've been there ever since. I've been a gospel preacher for 25 years. But thank God for grace and mercy. That God spared me. See, I don't have to keep repeating the same thing over and over and over to get it. When I young, when I was young, I did. We all did. Because we thought we knew everything. We 12 going on 25, and we broke as a joke. Living in mama's house. Eating up her food and everything else. But we we got we got an answer for everything, don't we? We want to tell mama how to go to work, when to go to work, what to buy me what I want, this and that. That sounds like all of us, didn't it? But then, when it's time to go out on your own, 
we find our way back to mama's house again. Live under mama's roof. Living under what mama said. Then we don't have no problem. But understand the mind of God. Understand the reason behind why God had to save man. He had to save man from himself. Not from him, but from himself. But I believe as we continue to, to look at these things, uh, that when Jesus took all of our consequences, for everything that we've done wrong, I can't even imagine in my mind why God would do what God did. That all the stuff that I did wrong, yet he wanted to save me. It doesn't even make good sense to me until I start to understand the mind of God. We were God's prized creation. And when God made man in his image and, and his likeness, that meant something to God. And the love of God for mankind that he gave his only begotten son. I don't know if you were on the highway or you came from the west side and you saw all that traffic this morning. All those people going up to that crazy place called the 500 Rest to watch some cars go around and sir and you can barely see them i've been one time and i've never been back but if we could fill the church up and people would get up on sunday morning and back the streets up just to get to church for somebody that died for them somebody that loves them and cares for them but you got people out here going to a race don't even know each other. Rooting them cars off. Who's going to win? Spending their hard-earned money for somebody else to get a big payday. That's crazy to me. You're not getting my money. I work too hard. God bless me. I got other things I got to do. I got to support the church. I got to take care of my family. I ain't got time to walk, see people go around in circles. I see enough people going around in circles every day. But it's where are we in our understanding of the word of God? Do we really understand what Jesus done for us? I believe if we start to understand it more and we understand that Jesus carried our sorrows, he was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was up on him. Jesus bore it all. The song we sing, Jesus bore it all that I might live. Jesus took upon all the, the ugliness that we do every day. And the thing about it, we haven't stopped doing it. We're still doing it. We're still nailing Jesus to the cross every day. When we give into our own desires, when we give into sin, we keep nailing him to the cross. How much does Jesus have to suffer? How much does God have to put up with our low living? We as children of God ought to walk a different path. We ought to do things different than the world does. But let me tell you some news flash. It's hard to tell the church of Christ from the world. And I'm being real. I've, I've been all over the brotherhood. Some of these congregations I go into, I'm like, what in the world is this? But it's no surprise. Because the word of God said there will come a time where man will not adhere to sound doctrine, but heaping to themselves itching ears. I read an article the other day in South Carolina, Church of Christ. Five elders did a study for five years on women being elders in the church. And they got in front of the congregation and said, after such extensive study, we have come to the conclusion that women can be elders in the Lord's church. I don't know what Bible they were reading. I don't know what they were studying. But I have not found that yet. And I don't have a Ph.D. I don't have any of that stuff. 
but they had to be crazy in their mind to play with God, to make a, to supersede the authority of God. God said, don't add to and don't take away from my word. You don't play with God. God is not to be played with. You don't give in to the world because the world is shifting toward women's right to LGBT, to homosexuality. You don't, if you turn on the TV, now I can't even watch TV no more. All my good movies, all my good actors, there's always got to be one of those homosexual scenes now. In the, and I'm paying all this money for cable. I said, I'm going to turn it off. I'm just going to watch basketball and football until they start putting them on the court with some of these shorts on and all that crazy stuff looking out there crazy. But we cannot give into society. Yet remember, at the core of it all is Satan. He want to continue to keep man confused about what God says. It didn't take number two words in the garden. Surely not. And God says, surely you surely will. And today it don't take much to fool people. It's because they don't have a relationship with God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you'll fall for anything. They will sell you anything. Even in the church, uh, it's all of the brotherhood. It's, it's, it's going because now homosexuality in the church, it's okay. Oh, God loves everybody. He does love everybody, but he already told you. You should not inherit the kingdom of God. And he listed all of them. Don't play with God. And if I care about you, I'll tell you that, hey, you can be whoever you want to be, but there's consequences. And that is not what God says. I love you enough to tell you that to your face. Change your ways before it's everlasting eternally too late. But Jesus took our place. He took our shame. He took the blame. He took our sins. He took our guilt. He took our deserving punishment. He took the wrath of God for us. Jesus took our place. That sets home with me. That Jesus took our place. He paid our sin and he did it voluntarily. I can just imagine in my mind when, when God said, I need a perfect sacrifice. I need somebody to go on my behalf, go down and see those people down there. They're out of control. They're doing everything contrary to what I said to them. I need somebody to step down, go down there and straighten them, give them hope. Someone without blemish, without spots, without wrinkle. I need somebody to go down and be a perfect sacrifice. Take on all their sin. And I knew it was just one person in heaven that rose his hand. It had to be Jesus. He said, I'll go. I'll do it. So Jesus put on flesh, came down to this cruel and wicked world. And, you know, on Calvary when they hung him to the cross, that wasn't the worst part. It was the process to get him to the cross. The things he had to endure, the things he had to go through to get to the cross. That's what we must understand. It's just not Jesus on the cross. It was what took him, he got him to the cross. And if you don't understand, just look at your life. Look at the direction you're going and see what made Jesus go to the cross. It ought to bring tears to your eyes. You ought to be ready to change on the drop of a dime. You ought to be a one to walk as a Christian, live as a Christian, do the right thing, even when it's not popular. You don't have to fit in with the world because the world will go with you to hell all by yourself. It's easy to take the road of least resistance. It's easy to follow the crowd. It takes more to do what God says do. But the reward is greater. 
You may not get it down here. You may not be popular with all your friends. You may not live in the best house. You may not have all the money you want. You may have to starve someday. You may not be able to eat steak. You got to eat McDonald's, whatever the case. But God didn't promise you that. What he promised you was eternal life. You'll be able one day go somewhere where there's no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more putting up with folks and their issues and problems. This world is a mess. But you got to give up something to get something. It didn't come free. His crucifixion did not come free. He had to pay the ultimate cost. That is his life. What is your life worth this morning? That's the question. I know mine is worth a lot more than what's going on in this world. I'm giving my life to Christ, not to the world, not to accumulate material things because they're only going to last so long. You're only going to find happiness in that new car that you bought and you financed it for 17 years and you pay six times the amount for it and it stops smelling like it's brand new. And then about year 10, it, it breaks down on you. And then you got to get another one. You're upside down and you can't get another one. And now you got to put up with that jalopy that you bought and put all that money into. Invest wise in everything you do, especially your soul. It is the greatest thing you got is your soul. And don't give it to anybody. Give it to the Lord. You want to be able to sit your, you know, your mind at ease as you walk this side of time's life. Because it's a struggle every day. Even as Christians, we struggle. But it was Jesus that discriminated, that, that, that showed his love. And you know, I'll share with this and I'm going to close. When my wife was diagnosed two years ago with pancreatic cancer, God gave us an assignment. Now, I didn't, I had, didn't have a clue in my mind that at age 57 that I would be sitting in a doctor's office and a doctor was telling me that my wife was in stage four pancreatic cancer. But God, as in his word, God is true. And it was not left up to me. It was all about God. Just as he told his servant Joe. When Satan came around, just wandering around, and, and he happened to run into Jesus one day, or God one day, and they got to talking. And Satan said, just wandering around, looking what he can see, who he can seek, and who he can devour and destroy. And God said, Had you ever considered my servant Joe? And I imagine Joe was just, you know, he had a lot. He had children, he had money. He had, Joe was on just minding his own business. But there was a conversation going on between God and Satan. And Joe had no clue what was going on. And God said, did you consider him? God allowed Satan to run havoc all over Joe. So when I look at scriptures, because I read my Bible, I study my Bible, because I know one day I got to be prepared for whatever's going to come to me. So when I was faced with that assignment, me and my wife, I didn't run from it. Lord, if you give me an assignment, you're going to see me through. I didn't know that at the end of the, the, the two years, she was going to leave here. Because I believe that God would take her and see her through. We would overcome this hurdle in our life. But you know, the days got longer. She got sicker. It didn't seem that God, God was blessing us the way I wanted him to bless me. Lord, I'm praying that you, you turn this thing around. I, you know, you have demonstrated your love to me because you put Jesus on the cross. I know you can do it. There's no doubt in my mind. But I was at an understanding, Lord, whatever your will is, I'm going to accept it. Because you didn't promise me this. You promised me something else.
But the days went on and they got a little bit more difficult every day. She would do better and then she would get worse. She got to the point where she was bedridden. She couldn't feed herself. I had to feed her. I had to be her by her side 24 hours a day. I had to take off for work. And I, t- I don't care if I work a job or be there when I get back. But my, for me to demonstrate my love for my wife, I had already been in contact with it because I seen Jesus go to the cross. And I knew that if Jesus had to dis- demonstrate his love for us, then I had to demonstrate my love for my wife. There was no other way. And as the days went on, the days got harder for me. She was taking all the medication. She was doing all the physical struggling. But I was struggling mentally and spiritually. I had to get some medication. My medication was the word of God and stay in prayer. To get us through the assignment that God gave us. Because it was all about us. Why Jesus came. And in her last days, as I shared at the funeral, I sat by her bedside. She was in so much pain. And I would wipe her mouth just to give her a little water. I would suck water out of a straw and put it in her mouth so she could have a little water. But I was demonstrating my love for her. My love ran deep for her. I then understood the love that God had for mankind. That he would give his only son. God allowed me to 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 go through this for a reason. I didn't know and I didn't understand, but I know that he wanted me to go. through. There had to be a reason. And I look back on it as I sit there at her bedside and I thought about each day. God, what are you trying to tell me? Lord, I asked you to heal her. And I thought he didn't heal her. He did heal her. She was still here. Lord, I need her to stay a little bit of time. He gave me two years. He didn't tell me how much he was going to give her. And my third prayer was, Lord, don't let her suffer. He didn't allow her to suffer. Not to the point where she could not at least be here and have some kind of life. So I look at all the things that God did, and he demonstrated to me. And you know, now I'm in a different place. In my walk my understanding, and in my faith. God allowed me to minister to my wife in her time of need. Don't you know that took me to another level? In my understanding. Oh, I hated to see her go. I played a song for her in her last few minutes of her life. And I played that song and she opened her eyes and she started crying and then she gave her last breath. And she rested from her labor. And it, I, then at that time, I understood how good God was. He answered my prayer once again to demonstrate his love. But see, you know how deep your love is. Is when you have to go through some things. The hardest part of your life. God will put you in a position to see and test you to see what kind of love you have for mankind. Jesus already went through it. Now you're going to get a taste of it. Now when I read the Bible and understand God, the mind of God, I now understand the love God had for mankind. He gave me a glimpse of it. What sacrifice means. When loving somebody, when they can't do for themselves, when you're struggling mentally and you can't even know what the moral's going to bring and your hope lies in Jesus Christ. That's a powerful testimony who Christ is. Now I understand why God did what he wanted. Because he loved us. There's no greater thing than a man to lay down his life for his friend. And if God calls you a friend, you are free and indeed. God is good. So whatever you're going through this morning, whatever struggles you have in your marriage, 
your relationship or your kids, turn it over to Jesus. You don't have to go through it alone. It's, let me tell you, it's just enough to get up in the morning. I used to pop out of the bed and get up and jump out of bed and go to work. Now that takes one leg at a time, one thought at a time, one time laying back down, hitting the snooze button, and then I think about going to work. Because I'm tired physically. I'm tired mentally. The world, you know, things, we know things, we're not exempt from any things as Christians, but we have somebody we can go to that will renew our strength. And when your strength is being renewed spiritually, it helps you physically. Then you can go on another day. Put up with the crazy folks at work. Put up with your crazy husband. Put up with your crazy wife. And especially put up with your baby kids, the ones that you created. Because God loves them all. And that's the way in the mindset we must have as Christians. Love people and love them unconditionally. Let's bow our heads here first. You heard the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus had to put on flesh, come down and walk in this cruel and wicked world. It has done nothing but gotten worse over the years. But it's not a surprise. But if we hear the word of God and we put into action what we have heard, we believe it, and then we confess it, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, and repent of our sins, turn away from that which is wrong to that which is right, go down in that water to be baptized and then raised up to walk in the newness of life. That's what God promised. But that's not it. See, you got to finish the process. Revelation 2, 9, John said, if we live faithfully unto death, we will receive a crown of righteousness. He didn't say you had to live sinlessly because you can't. But when you have the, when you are a child of God and you live and you obey God, guess what? When you repent of your sin, see, the blood of Christ cleanses you and you're all new and pretty again in the eyes of God. And you can continue your walk in your process. It sometimes a little, takes a little bit longer for everybody else. Don't worry about everybody else. Focus on yourself. Everybody that's converted is not, I mean, everybody that's convicted, convicted in their heart is not converted. It's a process. It takes time. So if this brother's over here struggling in his walk, don't condemn me. It might just take a little bit more time to get there. That's grace and mercy. And that's God being long-suffering, that no man will perish. Because if your heart's right, then God's right in your corner all the time. So stop looking at everybody else and focus on self. And then when you get self together, then you can help that brother over there. Encourage him along the way. Live faithfully. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have peaks and valleys. That means stay in it even when everything else when everything else is going wrong. Stick with God. Don't leave God because he will never leave you. God is a man that cannot lie. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We stand on the promises of God this morning. So if you're not a child of God this morning, you have an opportunity that has been afforded to you, to a lot of people that didn't get it. Somebody didn't wake up this morning. Somebody died outside the ark of safety. That means they didn't have a relationship with God. And so when they stand before the judgment seat of God, and they were not a child of God, he's going to tell you, depart from me. I never knew you. You don't want to hear those words. Come judgment day. You want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in, and you can be with God forevermore and live in peace. So you have an opportunity this morning. God afforded it to you at a high cost. Don't leave here not being a child of God. It's the worst decision you could ever make in your life is to have the opportunity and never use it. And if you're a child of God, every child of God that I know of, 
And I'm not the sharpest tool in the box. God affords you an opportunity to get it right. It's not the big things that's going to trip you up. It's the small things that you're struggling with. Everybody struggles. Doesn't make you less of a Christian because you got struggled. Newsflash. Every Christian from the pulpit to the pews got problems and issues. Some of us just deal with them in a different way. Some of us hide them. Don't hide it. Confess your faults one to another. That don't mean you got to tell everything. So confess your fault. We didn't tell people we're going into a story because everybody can't handle your problem. And that was the one reason that I did what I did with my wife and her sickness. I put it on Facebook. I wanted everybody to see what God is doing for me and my wife. I'm not trying to hide she's sick. I wanted you to see the power of God and our relationship that somebody, we might be able to help somebody along the way. I had people call me, Brother Jefferson, you put too much on Facebook. I said, don't call me. Tell me what to put on Facebook. That's my book. It's not your book. It's my story. And if you're not in it, guess what? Close the book. This is my story. And see, my story has one author. And he was the finisher of my faith. That's Jesus Christ. I want to tell the world, look what Jesus is doing in my life. But then I got a whole lot of calls saying, Brother Jeffers, you helped me out a lot. Thank you for what you've done. Sharing. It helped me. That is because what Jesus done on that cross. All because of you and me, we have the opportunity to share what we go through, what God has blessed us with, what we will continue to bless us with. So the message is yours. We just gather and stand and sing the Savior's invitation. Thank you. Jesus was a sinner. Are you washed in the blood of a lamb? Are you fully trusted in his grace? Do you not? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are you washed in the in the soul cleansing blood of the land, are you born with spotless for the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land? In your side of are you washed in the blood? There's a fountain Before I have my seat and turn over to the brothers, again, I want to thank everyone for your uninvited attention this morning. I hope and trust and pray that I said something that might will help you along your, your journey. I want to thank Brother Martin for the opportunity to once again stand before you. I know some of you didn't, uh, weren't able to make it to the uh, funeral uh, for my wife. Uh, I do have uh, some of her obituaries uh, left. I got a whole box of them out there in my car. If you want one, you're more than uh, feel free to get one. It just shows our story, her story. Uh, and we put it in a big booklet that you will see her in there. Just keep, keep me in prayer. Uh, I never thought at 59 I would be single again. And somebody asked me, Christian, Brother Jeffers, are you getting married again? I said, I am. To the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've been in training 41 years. I don't need to be retrained all over again. 
I got work to do. And uh, so I don't want nothing else hindering me from doing the work of the Lord. But pray for me that God will continue to give me strength, uh, continue to direct my path, because it's going to be difficult. Uh, I've had good days and I've had bad days. But it's good in the Lord. And, you know, this is this is a I've never been through nothing like this in my life. Because, and, and, you know, uh, I, I think about this and I have my seat. You know, we always try to look at music when we uh, think about a song or something and, and it, it helps you through something. Another day, the song came about Luther Vance Dross. A house is not a home. And, you know, as a preacher, I'm ready to take something out of that. Understand? And I understand a house is not a home. I got a house, but my home left me. That was my wife. Now I understand the loneliness and the things you go through. See, you can live in all, have all these material things, but if you don't, if it's not a home, guess what? All you got is a house. And there's only way there's something better than what I found out. I got a house that's not built with man's hands. It's waiting on me. And as I told my wife, I'll see you on the other side. Because I know where she went, and I know where I'm going. And nothing's going to stop me from seeing her again. So keep me in prayer. Keep my daughter in prayer. I got my 10th uh, grandchild coming. So I got plenty to keep me busy. Because you know how y'all are. Y'all like to drop your children over to your grandparents. And think that they're mine. They're not mine. Like I told them, they're not mine. You can come back and get them in about 24 hours. All right? Well, thank everybody. May God bless you. May God keep you.